Our final panelist is Judith Brown Dianis, who serves as co-director of the Washington DC based Advancement Project, a next generation multiracial civil rights organization dedicated to fulfilling America's promise of a caring, inclusive, and just society, democracy. Judith has an extreme background in civil rights litigation and advocacy in the areas of voting, education, housing, and employment. From filing one of the first ever lawsuits to enforce the motor voter law, to litigating on behalf of the black Floridians after the 2000 election, Judith has established herself as an expert in voting rights. She continued her litigation efforts in 2004, stopping the Republican National Committee from engaging in voter suppression in Ohio and requiring Virginia in 2008 to ensure equitable allocation of voting machines. As Advancement Project has committed its aggressive voter protection efforts, effectively blocking voter suppression efforts in 2012, Judith has also been leading an effort to develop a campaign to secure an explicit right to vote in the United States Constitution. In 2013, she was awarded a Prime Movers Fellowship for trailblazing social movement leaders to further develop this campaign. Judith joined Advancement Project at its inception in 1999 after serving as the managing attorney in the Washington, D.C. office of the N. AACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund Incorporated. She is a graduate of Columbia University School of Law. She was named one of the 30 women to watch by Essence Magazine and has written and commented extensively in the media about race, voting rights, and education issues, appearing often on MSNBC, CNN, and various television and radio shows. Judith will share perspectives on the state of voting in 2014 and what are the next steps to assure that voting rights remain strong and intact. Please join me in welcoming Judith Brown Dianis. Hello, everyone. First, I want to say um, thank you um, to the planning committee and to the co-sponsors of uh, this wonderful event. Um, thank you for having me. I am excited to be here and especially to follow um, the film uh, Freedom Summer, um, which was um, directed by a friend of mine, Stanley Nelson. Um, and I've had an opportunity to see it a few times, and it is incredible. Um, I also had the opportunity to actually go this summer um, to Mississippi for the commemoration of Freedom Summer um, and to be there with many of the people who were in the film. And so um, I'm glad to be here um, to celebrate the advances. Um, I also would like to say to, um, to Mr. Orr, um, thank you for all the work that you're doing. I feel after I heard your words that we will not be suing, suing you anytime soon. <laughs> So, um, so I want to start just by telling you a little bit about myself. I am a person who grew up in Queens, New York, um, and really did not live the kind of southern life and experience um, because as people say when you go south, they say, well, where are your people from? And I would say, well, my people are from New York. And they'd say, no, where are your people from? And I'd say, no, really, my people are from New York. They're from Harlem. Um, I am a second generation New Yorker, um, but my people are really from Charleston and from Florida. Um, but I um, grew up in New York and grew up in a household where voting was always important. From um, early on, I remember being a child and going into the voting booth with my mom. And I remember what a great experience it was to be behind that curtain and to hear the sound as she closed it and then to hear it open back up 
And we were like, woo, now we emerge. And to watch her click all the little buttons on that machine, those old machines that they just got rid of in New York City a few years ago. <laughs> um, and just how important it was in my family to show up all the time, that there was no off year. Um, every year was an on year for voting in my family um, because my parents knew how far we had come. And so it wasn't until I started, I became a civil rights lawyer that what um, was my experience was different from, you know, I'd read it in the history books about voting rights, um, but it really wasn't until 2000 when I had already been practicing for a number of years at the NACP Legal Defense Fund and had left to help start the Advancement Project um, that I really came into contact with just how bad it was. Um, I had already sued to enforce motor voter, um, but that was really because this was a good piece of legislation. And as you know, like we can have a lot of victories, but the ultimate victory is in how these laws are implemented. And to see Motor Voter as a victory, but then to see the state of Maryland not enforcing it was a problem. And so I sued them when I was at the NACP Legal Defense Fund. And in 2000, we had just, we opened Advancement Project in April of 1999. And the 2000, and we were doing education work, you know, we were trying to make sure kids could go to schools that were equitable. And in November of 2000, um, we had only, um, we had three people on staff at Advancement Project, three attorneys. And um, one of those attorneys went to the office of the NAACP in Baltimore to the headquarters to answer the phones on election day. And I stayed back in the office in DC and um, I got a call from our attorney who was in Baltimore and she said, there's a problem. It seems like there are a lot of calls coming in from Florida. And there was only one hotline at the time that was taking in complaints, and it was that office in Baltimore. And it was staffed, again, by one person from Advancement Project and one person from the NAACP. And all of the calls were coming from Florida. And so um, Tuesday, Wednesday comes. We don't know who the president is. What the heck is going on? Thursday comes. And my co-director, Penda Hare, who's a um, pretty prominent voting rights lawyer, said to me, I think we need to go to Florida. And so actually on that Thursday, I got on a plane with her. And we didn't know what we were going to do. Had no clue. But we got on a plane to go to Florida. We figured, we're voting rights lawyers. We'll figure it out. And while everyone was talking about recounts and chads, um, we did the work of finding the people who couldn't vote. And it was incredible to me that um, first on that weekend, I was there with the NAACP and was able to screen some of the participants who testified at a hearing that was held by the NAACP. And it was on C-SPAN, and I was the person in the back screening people, make sure, you know, weaning out some of the crazies. Um, but getting to the disenfranchisement stories. And the people who had been on the rolls for decades, always voting at the same place, and all of a sudden, they couldn't vote. And the Haitian Americans who came to America with the promise of being able to have a voice in democracy, yet they were not able to vote. And so um, I stayed, Penda and I stayed for months in Florida, back and forth, coming back to DC, but investigating what had happened. And um, little did we know that at the time that there really was a concerted effort to make sure that certain people could not vote. And we ended up putting together the evidence that became NAACP versus Katherine Harris. And for the next two years, I litigated that case. Um, and you know, it became clear to us that you couldn't wait until election day to fix the cracks in our democracy. That in fact, there had always been cracks in our democracy. There have always been times when there were people who were not supposed to vote. 
um, and it dates back to the Constitution. And it dates back to the fact that there were times when people who were in power didn't want other people to vote because it threatened their power. And so we've always actually had a war on voting. And in 2000, it was the first time that most people understood what a Secretary of State actually does. Catherine Harris really gave us a civics lesson. Um, and then in 2004, we saw more disenfranchisement. But I have to say that as the years have gone by in my career, um, from 2000 to now, I would say that the attack is more voracious than it has been. Um, that in 2008, what happened was that we did the unimaginable. We elected an African-American president. And I remember sitting on my couch in 2007 watching him, and I'm going to admit this, but my husband and some friends were sitting on the couch and having a conversation about these civil rights attorneys sitting here. We're going to elect the first black president. And I said, we're not going to elect the first black president. And I'm saying this in Chicago, I'm sorry. But I really <laughs> was not a believer because I knew the underbelly of our country on race. And I had spent a lot of time in Mississippi and in Alabama, and I just didn't think it possible. And so in 2008, we made the naysayer wrong. We did the unimaginable. And there's been backlash ever since. And the backlash has come in the way of a wave of voter suppression efforts that we have not seen actually since Reconstruction. So 2008 happens, 2010 happens, and we have an election in 2010 where it's so-called off years and many people didn't show up. And there was a wave across the country of backlash, of state legislatures flipping and Republicans taking over many state legislatures. And then we saw in 2011 voter suppression laws like we hadn't seen. And so about 30 states started to take up voter suppression efforts, passing laws that would make it harder for Americans to participate in this great experiment called democracy. And we saw the kinds of laws that were voter ID laws. Um, and people thought, it's OK. It's voter ID. You have to have an ID to get on a plane. So what is the big deal? Well, in fact, you don't need a photo ID to get on a plane. I always like to tell people this because if you have naysayers in your family or work, you need to let them know you actually don't need a photo ID to get on a plane. You actually don't need a state issued because most of these states that have passed these laws have required a state issued photo ID with your signature on it, with your current address. It cannot be expired and it has to have the current address. Many people move, but don't update their driver's license. And so this strict photo ID is actually being used because it's surgically crafted to hit the people who turned out in 2008. The backlash. And so it hits African Americans, it hits Latinos, it hits students, and it hits the elderly. And so we've seen these laws pass, and people keep saying, but it's about voter fraud. Well, as Mr. Orr said, you are more likely to be hit by lightning than to find a prosecutable case of voter fraud. In fact, you're more likely to see a UFO. <laughs> and so this voter fraud that we keep hearing about um, this voter impersonation where Mickey Mouse shows up and says that he's Judith Brown Dianus doesn't exist. And so the real fraud was the fact that they said that there was fraud. And many Americans have bought into it because, you know, if you go on Fox News and you say something enough times, it becomes true. So we saw these laws passing. We saw um, Pennsylvania. 
You may remember that there was in 2012 a video clip of a state representative, a Republican in Pennsylvania who said, Pencil, um, in Pennsylvania they passed voter ID, he said, check, Mitt Romney. They knew why they were doing it. And so in Pennsylvania, Advancement Project brought a lawsuit and we were able to win and stop voter ID in its tracks in Pennsylvania. It is through that litigation that people were able to vote in record numbers in 2012. But they didn't just stop with voter ID. They also had all kinds of other kinds of attacks that weren't just about the ID. So let's fast forward a little bit to 2012, North Carolina. In 2008, record number turnout in North Carolina. A southern state went for Barack Obama. I remember being, I was in Virginia with some union lawyers in Virginia. We were, um, we were making sure that everything was working well in Virginia. I just sued Virginia two days before the election around um, disparities in the allocation of polling places, of polling machines. And the reason we did that was because we knew the turnout in black neighborhoods was going to be much higher than ever before. And we knew, actually through my own experience, I used to go to work and say to my colleagues, how long did it take you to vote? Say to my white colleagues who lived in white neighborhoods, they say, oh, 10 minutes. That's 10 minutes. Oh, five minutes, five minutes. Why did it take me an hour and a half? And so I figured that's, huh, something here. Maybe the machines aren't spread out evenly. And so we sued Virginia, sued Governor Kane, got them to reallocate the machines. So when we did that, at the same time in North Carolina, when we're, I was in Virginia, North Carolina, we were calling each other to see who was gonna deliver the South. Was it gonna be Virginia or North Carolina? And Virginia went for Barack Obama. Well, what then happened was in 2010, the Republicans took over the state legislature. In 2012, they actually got a Republican governor. Well, in 2011, they had tried to pass voter ID, but the Democratic governor kept rejecting it. They tried to override her veto five times, one time in a midnight session. So in 2012, when a Republican becomes governor, what did they do? They went back and went back to voter ID. But wait a second, the plot thickens. Enter the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in June of 2013 says, by the way, this whole section five, section five of the Voting Rights Act, which is the thing that allows us to stop discrimination in voting before it happens because the Department of Justice has to ensure and pre-clear any changes in voting in those southern states that have been bad doers and a few other places, including some boroughs of New York City and some other places, that Section 5, it's not Section 5 that's unconstitutional. It's the formula to figure out who's covered. So you get rid of the formula, you get rid of Section 5. As John Lewis would say, they took a dagger to the heart of the Voting Rights Act. And so now that you don't have Section 5, North Carolina, after they get the Republican governor and they, have, they control both houses in North Carolina, they don't just pass voter ID, but they decide they're going to cut early voting. Why are they cutting early voting? Because in 2012, 70% of African Americans who voted in North Carolina used early voting. Then they decide to cut out the pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds. Then they decide to cut out the week where you can register to vote and vote the same day registration week. They're gonna get rid of that same day registration. And let me just give you some numbers on that. So in um, registration, same day registration, in 2008, 104,000 people used same day registration in North Carolina. And in 2012, for that first week, just the one week of early voting that they decided to cut, in 2012, 900,000 people voted in that one week in early voting. 
And so this wasn't by coincidence what they were doing. Again, surgically crafted to hit the people who turned out. But we also have to layer on top of this the changing demographics of America. America is browning. And so while America is browning, there are those that fear what those changes may mean. And so they have to make voting harder. Wisconsin. Wisconsin is a place where Advancement Project brought a lawsuit to stop voter ID in Wisconsin. 78% of African American males between the ages of 18 and 24 don't have the voter ID that's required. 50% of Latino voters in Wisconsin do not have the voter ID that is required. So we sued in Wisconsin under the Voting Rights Act, under Section 2, and under the Constitution. And we won. In North Carolina, and I'll tell you that case, Wisconsin, you may know, just went up to the Supreme Court. So we won, then we lost in the Seventh Circuit with a judge who wrote a dissent who was on board with voter ID when Indiana passed it that opened the door to voter ID. Judge Posner, he was, he's, yes, he was, he's had a, He's now enlightened, and he's on our side. And in fact, he said in Wisconsin that we proved up the discrimination, but also that the voter fraud that they talk about in Wisconsin, he called it goofy. <laughs> and he said, even paranoid. And so this is what we saw in Wisconsin. So we got to the Seventh Circuit, and then just last week, it had to go to the Supreme Court. And we held on. So voter ID will not be an operation in Wisconsin in this election cycle. Now, North Carolina, we tried to get it stopped. All of that bad law, we tried to get stopped pretty quickly through a preliminary injunction. And we won. We lost first in the district court and then won in the Fourth Circuit on appeal. A great decision by a judge who is an Obama appointee. Great decision. But then it went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, no, all of those laws can move forward in North Carolina. Now, Texas, of course, voter ID has gone up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has said yes. Texas, 600,000 people who don't have the voter ID, a judge in a district court who said it is an unconstitutional poll tax, yet the Supreme Court has said it's okay to move forward with voter ID in Texas. Now, part of the reason for this is that the court's a little worried about so-called last minute changes before an election. Well, I'll tell you, I think the last minute changes are these regressive laws that are taking us backwards. So, so where are we? So I just, you know, I'm the voice of doom. No, I'm not. Because in the doom, there's a silver lining. We've been here before. We've heard from people who were on the front lines in this fight. And so while we see state legislatures wanting to take us backwards, we're not going backwards. We're going to fight. We're going to fight in the courts. We're going to fight in the streets. Now, you all may have heard of this thing in North Carolina called Moral Mondays. Have you heard of it? So Moral Mondays, headed up by the North Carolina NAACP and Reverend Barber, um, is an incredible movement that is being built. An advancement project is we are excited about not only representing the North Carolina NAACP in court, but also working with them on building this movement across the state of North Carolina. Reverend Barber calls it fusion politics because what he is building is not just about black folks. It is about people who care. It is about the morality of that state. It is about the heart and soul 
of not only North Carolina, but of the South. And so what they have been doing is having these um, protests every Monday during the legislat legislative sessions. And over 900 people have been arrested. Going into the state capitol, they've asked to see their legislators. They've been told no. They sit and pray and they sing. And they have been arrested. And so we're seeing people coming together. What is incredible is it is multiracial, it is cross-class. They are taking on issues beyond voting rights. And so they have dedicated every, every Monday has a different issue. So they've taken on marriage equality. They've taken on expansion of Medicaid because the state doesn't want to expand Medicaid. And we see hospitals closing and people not getting, getting medical care. All immoral acts of a legislature that doesn't care about the least of them. And so we've seen them also coming together around education issues. Cuts to education, but giving $10 million to a voucher program so that children can use public money for private schools. And thank goodness that was stopped in the courts. But the Moral Mondays movement is really pushing back as their statement is, you know, um, forward together, not one step back. And they are fighting. And this is where the hope is, is that we are going to do all the things that were done before us because our struggle requires a fight. Our struggle requires us to fight on every level. And so at Advancement Project, not only are we litigating, but we're doing communications because we have to win hearts and minds. Americans must know that voter fraud is a voter fraud. Americans must know that there's a reason that this is happening. Americans must know that there is a better America, that the better America requires that we all have a voice in our democracy, that in fact, the one day in America where we are all equal is on election day. It doesn't matter if you are rich or poor or black or white, we are all equal when we walk into the voting booth. And so we have to get back to a moment where we are reinvigorating a voting rights movement. And that's what we are working on. We are working on not only the litigation and the communications, but also a campaign to actually put an explicit right to vote in the Constitution. Because we have to settle this fight once and for all. We have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, but we also needed the Voting Rights Act. We needed the women's suffrage movement. And now we have to settle the score. We have to let the courts know you can't mess with our voting rights unless there's a real reason, not a fraudulent reason. We also should have national standards around voting. Why is it that in some states you can vote until 7 p.m., you can vote for 45 days, and in some states you can only vote on one day. In Virginia, they don't have absentee voting except for if you have an excuse. You have to affirm under perjury that in fact you're going to be out of the state because of work or something like that. So why is it that we have states that are allowed to make it harder to vote for some Americans. And so we're working on this right to vote campaign because we think that we can reinvigorate a voting rights movement that will remember that this fight didn't stop in 1965 when the Voting Rights Act was, um, was passed. In fact, as I said before, the victory is in the implementation and we have not reached the promised land on this issue yet. And so we have Congressman Ellison and Congressman Pocan who actually have introduced an amendment for, a, for an explicit right to vote. In fact, it was your own Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr. who spearheaded this work. And so we are following up on that because we know that we have a destiny to fulfill, a destiny of inclusiveness, a destiny where every American has a voice in choosing those who represent them. 
And so we're building the movement, and we hope that you all will join. Because we need every one of you. And as we used to say when I was in law school as a student organizer, we used to say, we need our feet in the streets. <laughs> because that is how change has come in this country, is through a struggle, is through a fight, is through a movement. And so we can't turn our back on it because we have more work to do. Thank you.